Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About War Games, the podcast where we talk about war games. I'm Jack and with uh, me here today, as always, is Joe. Hello. Hey, Joe. How has your December been so far? Is tired an answer? I'm going to go with tired. Tired is a fair answer, yeah. My December um, has been tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've all been through some trying times on through these unprecedented times and you know to everyone who's been a constant listener at the podcast we just want to say sorry for not really having anything last month just that's how that's how COVID is and that's how adult life is yeah you know Um, those situations where about eight totally unrelated things come together just to land in your lap at the exact same time yeah like hmm there was a time before this but I don't remember (laughs) it yeah, we, we never really planned this as a weekly podcast to begin with, but probably at least once a month is something that we were shooting for, um, and we didn't meet that, so sorry, but we're going to make this a large episode if we can uh, manage it today, because we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, well, we'll make it up to you guys. We'll we'll be having more stuff coming out in the coming weeks. Yeah, um, I'll personally send you game codes for, I don't know, Battletoads? Oh, sweet. Can I get one? I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> raffling off of battle toads yeah that's gonna be a great advertising for for our podcast i think it's like oh yeah uh remember to retweet the uh <laughs> retweet the giveaway account and you could win a battle toads card from uh from the wargaming podcast yeah i, I wonder if we're mixing messages here battle toads is a war game <laughs> is is our stance that's what the episode's about i think i know what next episode's gonna yeah we're gonna <laughs> <Let's do laughs> it's it. a war game where do you draw the line now, it's steeple my fingers. It does have the word battle in the title, yes. I think that we did say, uh, we, we talked about this before, that we did want to make the argument at one point that Mario Kart is a war game. <laughs> I remember that we had that conversation. I mean, I, I suppose we can get into, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, area control and, and resource yeah, management. Well, specifically with like the uh the balloon part you know the balloon mini game where you go and blow each other up oh right yes yeah the glory days i remember that one <laughs> mario 64 was fun where you, if you lost it turned you into a little kamikaze exploding yeah yeah the thing. little uh like little goliath thing yeah Man. yeah video games are weird aren't they anyways no, that was fine that's normal anyways <laughs> we're talking about medieval combat today in case you couldn't tell um so <laughs> we wanted to uh, put together today's episode to kind of give a brief overview of what medieval warfare looked like and how it's portrayed in war games. There's a lot of variety here, um, so we're going to do the best we can to cover everything. We're not going to mention everything, obviously, because there's a ton of different games that cover this period, but we're going to give it our best shake to you know see what we can do to do this field justice Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the the historian in me is going to start with disclaimers because that's how you do everything and the periodization of medieval (laughs) let's get into that and how difficult it is or how like incorrect i would say it is to, to use like medieval as an actual thing for defining a period of time because that's very tied to certain conceptions of state development in western europe so yeah. it's easier just to say like the Middle Ages or you know something more broad and less uh, less connected to the rise and fall of particular empires, because even as we're going to talk about today, a lot of these medieval games that we're talking about are you know set several hundred years apart, dealing with very different people, systems, and militaries and whatnot. So it just yeah. makes the whole medieval thing difficult in the first place to talk about because you're just like, where, where, where do you want to stop or where do you want to start? Yeah, I, for the purposes of this episode, I think we've kind of roughly, from the games and what we're talking about, we're, we're kind of setting the bounds at around when Charlemagne uh, took power to around the, the very typical like, oh yeah, the Byzantine Empire has uh, fallen and there's nothing of them left. At that point, the people start to call it the Renaissance. Although even then, the Renaissance is, I guess, very medieval, quote unquote, in a lot of ways for a long period of time. So I yeah. don't know. Take that with a grain of salt. It's all tricky periodization, but I mean, it's just cover or let people know that we're going to be talking about a, a wide variety of things. And that if, if you feel so inclined as to tell us exactly when you think or if we're going beyond the bounds of the Middle Ages here, then you know, go ahead. I'm not, I'm not going to stop you. 
yeah i mean like engage with us anyway tell us you <laughs> like it don't like it whatever mm-hmm. we're, we're we're just happy to hear from you <laughs> anyway um joe it looks like these these are your notes about uh, medieval warfare if you want to get us kicked off okay and knowing that i'm not a, a scholar of this period or um this time this comes from very surface level research that we did for this episode and a lot of playing of games oddly enough mm-hmm. um yeah so it's the way i like to to approach this kind of thing is to talk about it as opposed to how we see it on tv so you know the the usual fantasy slash medieval version we're presented in pop culture is uh you know big armies of sweaty guys wearing you know liveried uniforms with swords and shields and they usually end up running at each other and clashing in some big brawl and people jump over each other or someone gets picked up and thrown you know it's all that usual rigmarole and they're always in the mud yeah it's always muddy or rainy they're or always gross. extremely dirty <laughs> and that's just a very unrealistic you know portrayal of medieval warfare mostly because it's trying to uh, drum up a scale of conflict that you just didn't see for the majority of conflicts that happened in the period because as we're you know going to talk about especially when we talk about crusader kings the western european social and political structure was one that relied on you know actual interpersonal relationships so you didn't have the means or the resources to create like a state army that was going to run around and cause havoc and you know willingly throw people away in front on charges it's about individual lords and their personal vassals who are their vassals because they or their fathers or father's fathers uh gave them that position and gave them the land and wealth in exchange for military service and protection so when you have that kind of relationship things are very personal campaigns are very personal and the acquisition of armed forces are again personal Because every uh, vassal who's called up by a king to fight in whatever conflict he wants to fight, in turn has to rely upon his own relationship with his um, inferiors and call them up to service. And in turn, all the way down to the the very bottom. A way I've always thought of it is like the kind of like the U.S. federal system where you have, you know, the federal level, the state level, the local level. It was kind of like that. But at each level, everyone had their own army that wasn't that big. And so when you have, like, you know, the king, like the top level, decide to go on a war against someone, he would have to go ask his uh, his direct subjects for men. And then those subjects would go ask their subjects for men and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And it's complicated slightly by the fact that, you know, there will be household knights for the king or any rich sort who can afford it um, and so on. But, yeah, I think what we're hitting at the issue is that it's expensive to fight wars. And expensive, oh, incredibly to, expensive. Um, provide the kind of material that in Western Europe in the Middle Ages people saw as, you know, the the correct way to fight, and that is mounted with heavy arms and armor, um, and more individually minded than, you know, what had been big during the uh, antiquity period with like right of spears and, and armies and whatnot. What really I think sets this apart from the periods on either side is that a lot of the things that were used in combat at this time, uh, war horses, armor equipment, wasn't really something that could be generally mass produced where it wasn't mass produced. Like it was, um, like the Romans could afford to more or less mass produce their equipment for their armies. Uh, and so could early, early nation states. Uh, so going up into the, um, the enlightenment period around the 1700s or so like they could really afford to mass produce things for their armies uniforms that sort of thing at this point in time a lot of people were just paying for their a lot of knights were paying for their own equipment um that's not true entirely across the board there are people who uh would be paid for and outfitted by their by their lords but a lot of the time people were responsible for basically maintaining their own equipment and everything because it was so expensive that no one could really depend on their higher-ups to pay them to maintain everything they got a tithe or basically a payment to make sure that they were maintained fighting shape but a lot of the supply and acquisition of goods for fighting 
came down to the individuals in question. Mm -hmm. And that's going back to that relationship system, because if you, the only way you could have become wealthy enough to be able to afford your own arms and armor is if you were in that kind of Lord to vassal relationship with someone who owned land or who claimed land. Right. And that's uh, another reason why you have this uh, focus on heavily mounted knights is because it is also a, a status symbol, right? It's a, it's a wealth symbol. So you need to be rich in order to be a knight and therefore to to have a knight fight for you, you need to be rich. So it's <laughs> something that kind of forced these armies to be smaller and less efficient than, you know, what you saw in, the, in antiquity. And that yeah. leads to some of the, the big issues with the actual size of armies, right? Because you're only ever seeing, what, a couple thousand up to maybe eight to 10,000 for the largest organized armies. And they're not going to be fighting in these long extended campaigns because, well, in some places you had like specific laid out terms of service where you would, you know, serve your Lord militarily for what, 40 days a year or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Or other places where it would be for the, the campaigning season, because, you know, your, your fighters are also tied to the management of your, land in your states so you can't uh be a lot of them were peasants yeah so they, would, they would have to go back and complete the harvest and everything because there wouldn't be any food otherwise yeah and people know not to depopulate the peasantry for fighting wars because that you know having food at the end of the year was way more important so that's why you have these uh medieval or, or western middle-aged conflicts are often either these wars of sieges or wars of raiding where you're just yeah. going along, taking what you can, looting, and then um, coming back after the season's finished. Yeah, more often than not, these weren't really wars of eradication or anything like that. It's not like a war where you would go and hope to attrition the enemy to death. Like you would, like you would see in the Roman period where the Romans and whoever they were fighting would just throw ungodly amounts of men at each other, you know? At, at Canny, the Romans lost like 60,000 men or something like that, and they just got back up and kept fighting. You would never see those numbers in, in the medieval period outside of... The Crusades are the only time I can think of such a significant number of men fighting, at least in Western Europe during that period of time. But even then, it, on either side of the medieval era, there were armies of much greater size than what you would see during this period because they just couldn't afford to have big armies. That just wasn't how things worked. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something I was looking for when we started playing games set in the medieval era to see if they're actually reflecting on this style of warfare. And mm -hmm. I don't know, what, what did you find playing some games? Did you think anyone actually did this well? The size of armies, the only one I can think of that really I felt nailed it was Crusader Kings 3. And we can talk more about that in a bit. But the size of levies and when you get further in, the, the standing men at arm regiments that you can have set up, uh, that, that felt about accurate to me. Of course, if you're playing with the foresight of knowing wh where things are headed in terms of military advancement, you can just invest a lot of money into men at arms regiments and have more than probably would make sense at the time. But, you know, it's a game. It's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, as for things like Total War, Total War has actually always been funny to me about this because their numbers will always go low because of the way that their graphics models work. And so they'll never show as many men in combat as there would have actually been mm -hmm. uh, in combat. I, I know we mentioned this actually a little bit in our last episode on horror and war games, but something like Canny, I mentioned it in the uh, Rome Total War 2. They uh, had like... 2,000 guys on each side, something like that. It was like a ridiculously small number when for this battle where there was like 150,000 men participating in combat, it, it's kind of laughable. And it, it carries over to the medieval period. It's not as egregious because the numbers are closer to accurate, but uh, you don't really see quite accurate numbers. I would say it's closer, but it's not quite accurate. But for other games like Field of Glory, I think that, that those do better, but those games are kind of vaguer in terms of uh, men involved, I would say, than these other games that specifically give you exact unit counts. Mm. And and stuff like Field of Glory is, you know, kind of an outlier in this medieval thing in that we're talking, th those games set up pitched battles, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of what you're doing campaign-wise, and you fight a pitched battle. Whereas, yeah, so that, that gets to pick and choose over the hundreds of years that these, uh, you know, they classify as medieval and, and choose the dozen 
pitch battles they could they could pick out and say let's let's have these in the game or something like um medieval 2 when i was last looking at that like medieval 2 total war it's you can have an army run around for eternity if you wanted to because that's just the nature of how total war works right mm-hmm. there's no real penalty to uh have your armies go charging about i found actually a uh, warhammer had a bit more if you play the bretonians actually like try to make you understand that oh you can't depopulate your peasantry because you're gonna need them <laughs> yeah it's kind of funny how the bretonians are the most accurate representation of a peasant based feudal system <laughs> in a total war game and that that is not saying much <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't know. I, I I can you can kind of see in some of the other games, but it's it's just funny how that ended up. Is that the the fantasy game where there's lizard men and skeletons and vampires and walking tanks and all of this stuff is the more accurate one. Yeah, funnily enough. Two, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think I guess I can give me able to the fact that your um, sieges are important, and that's for most total war mm-hmm. games, right? You you're eventually you're just it's a series of sieges, and that's one of the ways that wars were fought in the Middle Ages, right? You just castles are an excellent place to um, exert control over a region. So, fighting to take castles away from your opponent is basically the one concrete thing you can do to actually alter the uh, control of an area, right? Much more and, than um, fighting. And a lot of the time, the sieges of castles weren't really fighting sieges it was a lot of starving them out because even at the time even during the early medieval period uh attacking a lot of these forts wasn't really something that the attacking force had the manpower to do mm-hmm. and so a lot of the time it was just it, them sitting outside and waiting until the people inside either gave up or got help to come and scare off the attackers uh because i mean, thinking about it you try to assault stone walls or heck even wooden walls with archers raining down on you and you have probably less than a thousand guys most medieval lords would have that's not really a recipe for success no definitely not. so yeah so there are very few sieges that actually turned into assaults on fortified areas themselves in the medieval era it was just mostly uh just mostly starvation tactics mm-hmm. and i suppose you're right they're not going to see that in medieval total war because that takes way too long, and it's way easier just to oh, yeah, it's, rush the walls. Oh, yeah, it takes such a long time. And you know what? That's fair. It's way more exciting <laughs> to see like the assaults on the walls and everything. Every, everyone likes seeing that. It's much cooler than sitting outside and waiting for disease to kill everyone inside or whatever. So something else that I thought would be fun to talk about is, you know, the, the technological aspect of medieval warfare and how that leads into everyone's favorite internet back and forth of knights and archers and infantry and armor and all that fun stuff you know where where the whole of several hundred years of medieval history are reduced down into role-playing game stats how people are talking about you know oh we look at uh, Agincourt and the archers beat the knights there which therefore means that knights were useless and knights armor was useless and all that fun stuff and there's there's really a lot more to that isn't there oh yeah definitely it's something that people war gamers especially above saying is that this one thing worked in this one context and therefore it will work in all mm-hmm. and so yeah sorry go ahead no no go on, go on. so it's um it, it's just another situation like we uh we're talking about i think in episode three where people want to say like oh yeah the Wehrmacht should have really good stats because they rolled over the french in the polls and it's like that's not really that's not really uh, an accurate depiction of what happened here. It, it's people love to be able to put numbers on something and say this is an accurate depiction of how these what the efficiency of this is, mm-hmm. and it's very hard to do that with real life things because nothing in real life can be measured. Efficiency of something, especially when you put put the human element into it, you you can't measure it accurately ever. You just kind of have to guess. But people want to say it is always going to be these people have 50 attack and 30 defense, period. End of story. Mm-hmm. And that's just not how things go. Yeah, because one of the things I was doing when I was researching this was looking for... Like, I had an old textbook that I pulled out, and it was old. Like It, it felt old. It was written in that very um, classic style, which you can, you can just tell that they're, they're kind of pulling it out of their ass. And... They were talking about how uh, medieval armies would line up and then hack at each other and then 
the knights would come storming in and they would individually battle each other because that's what knights do and they're powerful and nothing could unseat knights. And I was thinking that just sounds wrong for a lot of reasons. So I was looking at some of the more recent research and, you know, there's uh, piles of examples of battles where footmen, especially well disciplined footmen, were toppling um, mounted, heavily armored mounted units you know, all throughout the period, the one I have right here in my note are the Swabian footmen at mm-hmm. Civitate in 1053. Mm. Civitate. Yeah, the Battle of Golden Spurs. And, yeah. I mean, and there's others. There's a famous one in the 1400s, which I can't find now, where the uh, Flemish peasants took down knights, right? But it's, it's, it's more than just one time. And I think that mm-hmm. goes a long way to, you know, the trickiness of dealing with uh, era of military history where everything materially is being produced you know in in local regions to be used by local people generally in local conflicts where it's really hard to have a standardized like you could say right the uh, german rifle in world war ii would fire this way and do this but it's difficult to know exactly what's going on for every single army's training and equipment and um, supply resources right. for these battles because it's, it's, everything is so different. It makes it very hard to gamify. And so much of that is individualized. You have two knights who are from the same region. They might have gone to different blacksmiths or they might have even gone to the same blacksmith, but from just the way that things are and the quality of craftsmanship back then, those two same people who are basically in the same position could have varying qualities and efficiencies of everything. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, it's because they might even have trained differently so it's very hard to put the uh put any dis- distinct numbers on a group of people and say they are like this mm. yeah and i think when we're um looking at some more recent articles and a couple books we last night did the library uh even that perception of what it was to fight in the middle ages like lining up and wailing on each other that just doesn't hold up to much scrutiny when you get beyond the the um more literary retellings of battles right because there's a you know human self-preservation is a factor (laughs) and the fact that working together tends to work better than working alone so knights you know knights i I say but i mean uh heavily armed and armored horsemen Mm -hmm. we're now thinking they they worked in groups right to uh to uh, charge and yeah my cavalry and you know attack weak sections of the enemy where they they found them duels in the sort did happen but those were mostly outside of combat the uh the only things that the only sources i could find on duels in combat are very rare and i don't have the source on hand but one instance was in Brittany, i think around 1200 or so there were uh basically two factions uh one french backed and one english backed that were trying to take over the throne of Brittany, and in order to avoid unnecessary extra bloodshed they just decided to both send about 30 knights into an into a uh, an agreed upon location and had them just wail on each other um that's fun and yeah i mean like you know like yeah let the rich people beat each other up i'm sure everyone loved that so and uh by the end of it i think only about eight to ten people died overall between the two sides and that's that was a rare exception. The, these sorts of things did not happen frequently, but I mean, because it's just it just goes to show that that's not how medieval warfare worked. It wasn't very chivalrous and dueling and all that fun stuff. It was uh not not a not a fun time, I would say, for most parties involved. Mm-hmm. I think we're unless you're like a sadistic king who enjoys watching this stuff, which there were plenty of those actually. Yeah, that reminds me of a poem I had to read in second year medieval history which was uh some 12th century duke or something talking about the wonders of the weather and and how he loved the spring air because it meant it was campaigning season and he got to go out and wear his armor and smash up the peasants and like oh you seem like a a well-balanced person buddy (laughs) (laughs) yeah the same sort of thing you get the same sort of thing with the uh the japanese of the period because you know you also had the local samurai lords going out and testing their new katanas on the peasants also. Um, they loved campaigning season because it was a chance to, like, you know, show off and stuff. Yeah, but, I think you bring that up because it's a, you're going to have a lot of the same kind of myths surrounding 
Western medieval armies as you are with the East, yeah. right? With the uh, ideas of chivalry or, or yeah. or whatever you want to call it and how it influenced the warfare that just didn't really work that way. Yeah. I, the thing, the bottom line is that essentially, and this is painting a broad stroke, but I would say it's generally true uh, across most of um you know north africa europe in general and the eastern parts of asia during the period it can be defined by basically just like rich people wanted to show off (laughs) it's it's kind of i mean well maybe this is too spicy but that's kind of what warfare has been for a long time but especially during this period because so much of it was defined by personal i am going to do this for my own personal gain whether it be my own concept uh conception of honor or make my family richer or whatever it, it's it's for their own it's for their own benefit basically most of the time i suppose we are at a very different um reasoning structure than modern statehood even though there's a lot of overlap with what people want to see i mean you could say that politicians are rich people who just want to show off <laughs> i think you've solved history in one go i have i have done it <laughs> The podcast is over. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm going to go and accept my title as the new Francis Fukuyama. <laughs> uh, I like it, though. All <laughs> right, so we're going to talk about any specific games? Yeah, let's uh, let's get into some of this. Um, some of these war games I keep hearing so much about. First, I want to point out real quick, we, we did actually, I, I actually had a uh, book on hand that I got some concrete numbers out of that aren't very interesting. But I think it is important to share uh, th- some of the administrative ways that some of these armies worked because it is immediately very different once we start talking about these games. Oh, yeah, so part. in France, in the Middle-ish, Middle Ages, so around the 1300s, uh, it was defined by, military command was defined by, you know, the king is at the top, obviously, but... He also had a staff of advisors, so in this case, for France specifically, it can change from place to place, but a lot of it was similar-ish to other ones. Uh, He would have one constable, who is the administrative chief of the military, and then he would also have two marshals with looser responsibilities to go and wage wars, but also help with the setup, recruitment, and arming of uh, his armies. Hmm. Notably, when the king or these guys aren't present a lot of battlefield decisions were made by a council of the local important people who were there so i I think that's something important to point out is that making battlefield decisions by council hasn't ever really been a great idea Um, (laughs) you can see this pretty recently actually in the early uh ussr when they tried to get uh, Soviets of conscripts to decide how they wanted to fight, and those always went really, really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it never really went well. It went very poorly. And yeah, didn't they abolish uh, medals for like and ranks for a week or two, and then brought those right back? Yeah, I, I think that. I, I to be fair, the Russian military had a lot of problems with meritocracy and aristocracy and everything. But they went hard opposite direction and decided to make themselves as ineffective as possible, which I guess, to be fair, they kind of already were. But we're talking about medieval warfare. (laughs) Um, And one other thing I wanted to mention is that there was actually a fair amount of fraud when it came to local knights and bannermen trying to get money from their lords. So something that I ran into is actually that based on your fighting status, whether you were going to be a... uh, I believe the word they used was valet or fighting men or armed man on a horse. I don't remember the specific words that they used, but depending on your stature, you would get a certain amount per uh, per month or per year to make sure that you would equip yourself. And so what a lot of the um, people would do is they would basically trade equipment around to give themselves better equipment for when the auditors came in to see what they were worth, basically. And so they would go and like have their friend bring them their really good horse and uh, get and trade over the really nice sword and all this stuff for when the king's men showed up to go take a look because they would say, oh, like, yeah, you're a really uh, rich and well-off knight. Here's like 50, uh, 50 French, French bucks as opposed to, you know, uh, you are actually riding a donkey and are wearing 
just terrible studded armor here's like 10 and this would actually happen a fair amount and um it's kind of widespread from what i can tell so with that in mind it's kind of hard to actually tell how many fighting men from records at the time were very accurate because people raising their stature was kind of widespread could you imagine playing a game where you got stats for your unit and as soon as they got into combat the stats all drop by 30 points that would actually be fantastic and i would love that <laughs> you just you just can't tell sometimes the numbers are deflated and sometimes they're inflated feel like but you can only tell when you're actually in combat that would be awesome <laughs> yeah it feels like an age odd game where you're just kind of clicking on the bad guy and say go i think think you'll be all right <laughs> uh, maybe we'll see <laughs> yeah uh anyway let's talk about some games so First thing off, we're talking about the big dog in the room, the one that recently released uh, beginning of September. We're talking about Crusader Kings 3. Uh, if you're listening to this, you've probably heard of this, but I guess just for a brief overview, if you're not familiar, Crusader Kings 3 is a uh, combination grand strategy game set in the medieval period, starting around, I think, the late 800s up to 1453. And you get to play as a head of a medieval house. And so you can move your guys around on the map and you can adjust things in your provinces and deal with uh, inter inter uh, political things like that between different houses. But you also play as the head. Um, so all of the characters in this game have RPG stats and uh, can have personal relationships with other characters in the game. It's very in-depth. And it's one of the better depictions of the reasoning why medieval warfare would happen, in my opinion, because a lot of medieval warfare was personal to some extent. And in this game, uh, since everyone is modeled as a person, all the nobles are modeled as people, they can decide for personal reasons whether they want to go to war with you or don't. So, you know, if someone doesn't like you, even if there's no reason for them to really come after you, they may just attack you just because they hate you. <laughs> And I, I, that's that's kind of realistic. It's the um, ever-present concept of, you know, f*** that guy. Yeah, but I like that part of the game because that, that is, you know, what we have documentary evidence of. A lot of the smaller conflicts in the medieval period is usually king or, you know, high person dealing with disloyal vassal X or lamenting their inability to deal with disloyal vassals X, Y, and Z. So, like, that being the front and center of the conflict of crusader kings that's just perfect for me because that's that's what we have right you have very few grand sweeping campaigns and more of just goddamn count what's his face he's he's stymieing me again <laughs> yeah and frequently a lot of the fights you will have could be civil wars you know you decide like oh i don't want to pay my king x amount of taxes anymore i'm going to fight him and have him lower my obligations to him or uh this this person thinks that he deserves to be the throne have the throne uh i'm going to go fight him now or uh you know i'm trying to revoke a title from this person and he decided to declare war on me a lot of the things that you'll end up doing is fighting your own people funnily enough mm -hmm. and that's one of the uh you know one of the many um proposed idea for why the crusades were a thing right because you have the the church trying to pull that kind of violence into something that could be productive for them right don't don't kill each other go go fight go fight um infidels over there in spain and in, in, in the middle east and all that and that's why you get yeah. a lot of those prescriptions of you know what chivalry become is is like rules against fighting like oh you can't fight on sundays or oh you can't fight in this particular month because it's holy for this reason so you have the church trying to to stop this this bleed of manpower <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the Catholic on Catholic sense. violence. Mm -hmm. They didn't want that because they. Uh, well, I, th I mean, at the time, the Catholic Church was kind of the predominant power in Europe, and you could even maybe say that the medieval period is kind of the point in time where the Catholic power, the Catholic Church, was the predominant power in Europe. Yeah, I mean, um, if you ask them at the time, legally they owned the entire thing, right? And they were just renting it out yeah. to these lords. <laughs> yeah, and indirectly they influenced all of this stuff. So. It's something that is interesting to contend with, especially in this game, because the Pope is also modeled as a person and with his own petty wants and desires, he can also direct you to go, uh, you know, do whatever, go invade Israel. 
Yeah, they still have like a randomly generated, well, not randomly generated, but like uh, ad hoc crusades popping up in Crusader Kings 3, right? They're a big thing in number two, for sure. Oh, yeah. I I would say that they happen more frequently in CK3. I think that they recently patched it so it doesn't happen as often Mm. um, to make the build up period longer because it used to be five years and now they're making it 20 years of it being stated that this is going to happen in 20 years. Everyone on both sides prepare. Okay. So that's so that's kind of a big change because there used to be a lot of crusades. It gave me a lot of grief when I was originally playing because I was playing as a uh, a Christian heresy basically, <laughs> and I was trying to take over the uh, the British Isles and the Catholic Church just kept calling crusades on me repeatedly, and there was nothing I could do to really stop them. So I would take some provinces, they would come in, kick me out, and then I would creep back in, and then until they noticed again that I was doing that, and they would come back and the cycle repeated until the end of the game basically yeah see i I like that that's uh again that's pretty you know accurate if i can use the word because that's something that happened right whenever you have these kind of uh uh heretical beliefs popping up or and gaining a foothold somewhere you would often have the pope declaring a a crusade against them it happened in france in the carcassonne area happened all over the place i were somewhere that is known for this really is actually uh northeastern europe around the uh the baltic region there there was a crusade up there and not a lot of people remember this one because people think of crusades it's like oh yeah they're fighting the muslims in the middle east and it's like yeah there were a couple three down there but notably there were some also in other places as well and uh, i'm never going to forget the pope for kicking me out of uh england for like five times (laughs) made me real mad yeah actually there's a um a tabletop game that I've been trying to get my hands on forever called Nevsky Teutons and Rus in collision mm. 1240 to 1242. And it's a, it's a area control point to point, like very, very like traditional war game, but you are either playing the Teutonic order or, you know, the, the Slavic people battling in this period where you have the, the Pope trying to push Christianity into, um, you know, Northeastern Europe. It's, it's a fascinating period. I'm glad they started to, seeing some big big name games coming out of for it yeah i hope it gets some more attention um but ck3 does basically show that and that's great i guess the gist of this whole thing is that the casus belli uh so cause for war basically in latin is a big thing in uh paradox grand strategy games like what uh, crusader kings 3 is and it's interesting because in this one they model it on the personal identities and personalities of the lords because you know they can have humiliate as a casus belli saying oh i hate you so i'm gonna come over there and not really take anything from you but just kind of show off at how much better i am than you and there's also things like oh you're a different religion i'm gonna come over there annex your territory kick you out because i'm god's chosen faith etc etc you've you've heard that one before Uh, but there's a a lot of different reasons for it and i think that the game did a really good job modeling all of the different reasons that you could go and uh, you know beat someone up Mm -hmm. it's nice just modeling the more personal uh reasons for conflict than say more state-to-state things like you would find in a total war game of we want to conquer this territory or you know in, in later um paradox games themselves like eu4 or victoria 2 where it'd be very uh high level state things like we must expand our sphere of influence. You know, this mm-hmm. is uh, this guy's the wrong religion, or he slept with my wife, or something. Yeah, in in Crusader Kings three, pretty much all of this is tangible, and it would make sense for a specific person to think this, as opposed to, you know, a Victoria two to uh, think, oh, I want to expand our country's sphere of influence. It's such like a vague concept; you can't even. It's hard to even conceptualize as a specific person what doing that to another person in that country would do. But in this game, it's I want to go kill that guy, basically, or I want to go you rub it in his face that I'm better than him, or I want to make him convert, or, you know, I want to make my king stop having me pay so many taxes. Mm-hmm. And that's cool, too, because that's, that's getting into, oh, when was it, the the whole British thing, English thing, where they... Yeah, it ended with the Magna Carta. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> I'm a historian. <laughs> They have so many. They have so many civil wars at this point. Like who? Who's keeping track? <laughs> they, they they fought each other, got angry, and then they had a do- then they had a document that said, "Oh, let's not do this as much anymore." And people are it's trying like, to yeah. use it to justify 
skirting COVID restrictions now. See, history's alive, people. <laughs> I did not hear that. Oh, I didn't hear that. that one. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. my God. The, the, <laughs> no offense to any British listeners out here, but you guys need to get a handle on yourselves. Like, speaking as an American, I know, but, like, come on now. Yeah, speaking of smoke Canadian, yeah, come on, guys. Get, no. no, we have our fair share of crazies up here, too. We've had some. Well, is your head of state? You deal with her. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> The connections, the old, the old ties, they come back. Yeah, you, you go, you go and say, hey, hey, we'll be part of the Dominion again as like an official thing if you fix this. <laughs> I think people need help all over the world. There's a yeah. Well, <laughs> for some reason, it just keeps seeming to be English-speaking company uh, countries. Weird how that works. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um. Anyway, Crusader Kings Three is great. Uh. Not in, in addition to the way that it models uh Cassus Belli and the individual people involved it also does a good job modeling the army system at the time I, I mentioned earlier uh, how it's hard to really define the armies and how it wasn't really just oh knights and then peasants because a lot of a lot of media at the time likes to show it's like either these guys in armor on horses or the dirtiest people imaginable wearing linen and having like pitchforks you get the braveheart and, kind of costuming going on yeah the freedom etc whatever <laughs> um and uh ck3 will let you recruit what are basically your your peasant mobs i think that they're just called levies and these forces are given like some base stats they're they're fine they're never going to really be a huge factor in and of themselves, but they will make up the bulk of your forces for most of the game. However, you can also uh, pay to set up and maintain uh, standing retinues. And the way that the game models this isn't uh, fantastic because, well, I guess actually, now that I think about it, it's better. I was thinking of the CK2 retinues, actually, but these are uh, men-at-arms regiments, which are basically groups of specialized soldiers so you can hire uh some bowmen light horsemen pikemen etc etc of a bunch of different unit types and these are essentially your professional soldiers that you are going to pay extra out of pocket to maintain uh like we mentioned earlier with the whole uh the lord will pay x extra uh, x amount of dollars to armed soldier to make themselves uh to keep their equipment and everything maintained that's what these are these are your specialized soldiers and even though not all of them are knights they're all more professional than your unwashed peasant mobs and all of them will be able to fight against uh other units better than your peasant mobs and except for i think the artillery pieces which are just like 10 guys standing around a trebuchet <laughs> so is that differently modeled than the freelancers and the, the mercenaries uh, mercenaries will frequently be in that game. They'll be made up of largely professional professional regiments. So you hire a freelance mercenary group, and they'll be made up of different men-at-arms regiments. And so they'll have, like, oh, we have three uh, archer regiments and five swordsmen regiments and th three light infantry regiments or whatever, what have you. Mm. And I don't remember, I don't think that they will also come with peasant mobs but i do know that they're supposed to represent like professional trained groups and so you you pay them a big chunk of change but they are a legitimately very helpful factor because any as i said any mercenary regiment except with like um, artillery pieces will be able to hold its own against many times the number of peasant peasant mobs mm. and that's interesting because i mean that's that's part of you know, money was the main factor here, right? So hiring mercenary groups to uh, round out your forces was just part of the uh, the everyday military thing in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And they are very expensive, so you can't afford them much. Uh, frequently, you'll end up going into debt to pay for them, but the amount it takes to pay for and maintain a, mil a mercenary group is way, way more expensive than it is to maintain the equivalent amount of your own forces. So you got to really plan ahead if you're planning to hire these guys no, it's cool. and i think that that's an accurate thing to the period mm -hmm. it's also kind of reinforcing the um the brevity of campaigns right if you if the game's saying you can't afford to play with mercenaries for more than a few months that's reinforcing the fact that you shouldn't be campaigning for more than a few months right 
the way that the game actually models it is interesting and i think it it simplifies it but i think it's kind of necessary um is that you just drop a large sum of money on a mercenary group and for three years they're under your contract oh uh, and then at the end of the three years you can either choose to drop the same amount of money on them or let them go oh, but for those three years they're all yours huh and I think that it's that's not very accurate, but it does add to ease of play. Yeah, that's something we have to take into consideration. Because as much as I love to stare at spreadsheets when I play my video games, I know a lot of people want to enjoy themselves. <laughs> so I think that's important that we're actually, you know, not being critical of a game because it is doing something that is for the benefit of players. We're not grognards. No. But. But. Sorry, give me a second. I'm eating some mashed potatoes. <laughs> Sorry. That's... But what I wanted to say is that it should be pointed out that there is a big glaring accuracy flaw in Crusader Kings 3 and the Warfare in that there will be rally points that you can put up on the map that are where you draw your army from. And so you can put these in various places around land that you own. And if you click on one of these banners and click raise army, your army will more or less just assemble there very quickly. Oh. And it's, yeah. So the way that it's currently set up, if you put this system together smartly, you can kind of just teleport your army instantly to where it needs to be if you raise it at the right time. Oof. That sounds um, like a bug though, right? Like they're going to fix that, right? It's not, it's a, it's a feature. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh no. Uh, it's something that they, they, they will fix, but it's something that's kind of hard to, to model because... If you remember from the first game, or I shouldn't say the first game, Crusader Kings 2, it was very obnoxious to raise up levies in all of your minute provinces and have them all trail together to one area. And so the idea behind the system, I think, is fine. But, for example, in my uh, game I mentioned I was playing as Ireland, happened upon some territory on the northern coast of Germany, and one of those provinces was attacked, and so I was able to just... It's like click the button, raise my army over there in Germany. And there's some assembly time inquire, required for the forces to come together, but it's not that long. Mm -hmm. So I think really warrant this being something that you can do. Because I, I think that like, yeah, you can raise your army wherever that makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, have them assemble here. But the fact that it's more or less instant because the, um, the men at arms will be there instantly. It's the local unwashed peasant forces that take time to assemble see that that bothers me because that's flying in the face of the biggest thing with organizing and using an army in the middle ages in europe and that's the logistics of maneuvering that army and if you can one button get rid of that and have them show up wherever you need them that really goes a long way to undermining that kind of consideration when you're fighting your wars because you can think of if you're a uh, a king in Ireland, and you have to defend some position in northern Germany. That's going to be insane to try and do. So much that yeah. you probably wouldn't even try to do it. I think the logistic system of the game, once armies are on the field, is modeled well because you have to keep track of the supply limit of each province you're in. Like, I won't be able to walk through here and have my men just live off the land. We're going to have to bring supply carts with us and stuff. I think that's modeled well, mm. but the logistics of just being able to get men from place to place is rather simplistic uh, before you raise them up as an army. Well, I, I will hold it hope that they will uh, deem this a bug and, and do something to fix it. Cause that's, that's a little too bad for me. I, I think, I think they will. And the way that most of the game works, it's not too egregious. It's more obvious if you have a widespread area, like, like I mentioned there. I didn't even purposely go after Germany, but I had some people lower in my uh, lower in my kingdom inherit it. So I was like, oh, I guess uh, I guess this is happening now. And so I will say for me as a player, it was very convenient to just suddenly be able to snap my army over there. But it did feel kind of cheesy. Mm. So, you know. Like most things, good and bad, but it, it like, is what it is, I guess. CK3 has a lot going for it in terms of modeling those kinds of things you want to see modeled in a war game dealing with Middle Ages, i.e. The, the interpersonal conflicts, the local level of fighting, the mm -hmm. primacy of the church in politics, the endless civil wars and, and bickering between 
dukes and counts and kings yeah. and whatnot. So it's good to see that there. Not to mention, actually, we haven't even talked about how combat itself is like plays out. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> forgot to do that important thing. The way that it's done in CK three is interesting in that there. In addition to your men at arms regiments, you'll also have knights present in each army. And knights represent, like you know, the the really important bannermen for each uh, side in the conflict. And a knight is worth basically a lot of peasants because these guys are the will be the stereotypical. I am a big man on a horse riding around and hitting people with a big sword, and they just get cut in half because I'm so large. They they basically are that hmm. uh, stereotype. And, you know, to to be fair, these kind of did exist also, but in CK in CK three, it's not really because of the way that the battles are shown, it's not really clear if they're working in groups or not. Um, but it, it's essentially like, oh, uh, yeah, these are your elite soldiers that would have had the most training or whatever. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, OK, fine. I, I, I can kind of I can I can buy yeah, it. I'll buy it. I'm down. Yeah, I'll buy it. But um, all of these knights will have their own personal combat skills and. What's interesting is that in these fights, they will account for a lot of peasant kills or bended arm kills themselves. And they can also fight and wound or kill the um, knights on the other side or the enemy leaders. And that's an interesting aspect to this is that that sort of thing would happen at the time. You know, after some battles, they would kind of keep track of like, oh, yeah, I killed this guy. That's neat. But it wasn't like. As far as I know, it wasn't like a big headhunting thing. They didn't go out to do that. No, no, the big thing was ransoming, right? He wanted to capture. Yeah, the ransoming. It's it's better to capture someone because you could get a ton of money for holding on to someone and saying, "Give me X amount of money, or I'm holding you indefinitely, or killing you." Yeah, that was just the accepted way, right? Like uh, I read uh, Fossar. Uh, he did the Chronicles of the Hundred Years' War, and he was talking about you know when the battle was lost, he'd have knights riding up and saying like, "Oh, hey, buddy, it's it's me. You want to take prisoner?" I'm like, yeah, sure, come come along then. And then you have other times where that was a that kind of trust was gone. Like, um, of course, I'm drawing a blank on specific name, but there was a war between Portugal and Spain, which of course happened all the time. But the Portuguese captured a bunch of Spanish knights, and then it looked like they were going to be overrun. So, in a panic, the guys keeping the knights that they captured uh, prisoner uh, freaked out and killed them all. And and that was a big no no on both sides. Everyone was losing their mind when they found out that. They executed these guys that they had prisoner because not only is the ransom gone, but that's like you, you're killing the knights. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> that's not that's yeah. not what we do here, guys. <laughs> so the ransoming the and of course people died. Of course they did. Of course I'm not saying that like you know the 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 rich never were killed in these battles. Of course there's, there's medical science is not super duper great in Western Europe in the middle period. And if you got hurt, you're probably messed up for life. But the intention was to earn money. You know we're talking about raiding warfare again, right? by capturing yeah. wealthy people the intention wasn't to kill people that was rarely the intention of one of these wars it's about making money so it's, yeah, it's good that it's... They, they model that but they also do model that they're 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 gonna fight and kill each other because they you know mm-hmm. you're playing with sharp metal objects yeah th- this this will happen uh you know it's all about the dollar dollar bills y'all uh but anyway talking about the fight itself so you have all these constituent parts you have the peasants you have the men at arms and you have the knights And then you have the leaders for each side and the leaders for each side will basically, depending on the terrain, add their own bonuses to how strong their forces are. And that is what determines how much damage one side is doing to another is that all of the points will be added up on one side to determine an advantage is what the game calls it. And the side with more advantage will end up doing more damage to the other side. And there's there's a bunch of modifiers in it and it's very complicated to follow. But it's interesting because all of the constituent men at arms regiments will also have territory, have a terrain that they're better or worse in fighting in. So, for mm-hmm. example, like bowmen will be better at fighting from hills. So will pikemen. Heavy heavy knights will be terrible at fighting in hills and this sort of thing. So, you can build your army to fight smartly in these territories. And all of this combines into what I would say is a really well done battle system. It's one that's kind of hard to understand everything that's going on at the moment, but it makes sense. Hmm. And it's pretty good, I would say. It's probably one of the better models of medieval warfare at the time. Hmm. That's encouraging to hear. Although I do think that the death counter is probably higher than it would have been. I think that death slash 
wounded and will never fight again should probably be the more accurate mm. name for that category. Like casualties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because and I feel like that's the thing with a lot of games where the the death count is just always going to be a bit higher than normal. Of digital games, I mean, because I don't know, people like seeing bigger numbers. <laughs> I mean, if you're playing um, Field of Glory or uh, Pike and Shot or whatever, the, the numbers are about what I expect for battles. Like a uh, um, Sengoku Jidai, the Pike and Shot Field of Glory game for East Asia, those numbers are pretty good when it comes to, to killing people. So it's not everything, but yeah, I, I can believe. Like Paradox Games seems that the numbers are ridiculous, like with Hearts of Iron or EU4. Yeah, I would say so. But overall, I would say CK3 is pretty well done in terms of a uh, game showing this stuff. Mm -hmm. I would I would say so. How, how much of a chance have you had to play it? Not as much as I would like. I, I played mm -hmm. a little bit back uh, about a month ago when I, I, I got a hold of it. And then, you know, with the whole tired December, I, I just haven't had I haven't played many games in the past couple months. <laughs> if You can believe it. You're off the podcast. <laughs> No, no it, it, I mean, I understand. Um, I've been in the opposite situation, but like a lot of life things, you know, just keep coming up. Last month for me was like, I, I played some CK3 and then the new expansion for Destiny 2 came out and I, I played a lot of that. So I, I just kind of <laughs> ended up getting, getting sidetracked and then I was like, four games? What? What is that? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I've been playing what I've been reviewing. Um, for the yeah. different websites I... I, I... Right I've seen a lot of your reviews up lately. You've been pretty productive. Yeah, so I mean, I guess is that why you're so tired? What was me? I have to play video games and board games and review them. But <laughs> that's terrible. How dare you enjoy your hobby, <laughs> sir? Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a list of them that I do want to play more. I mean, Secret Three is on that list, of course, because it's yeah. it's the big new hotness, right? And I need to I need to see what's up. And I want to see how they handle um, uh, North Africa and India and all those places they attach in the game that aren't Western Europe, because. They had, it took a long time for them to do a decent job with those in CK2, and I want to know what they did off the top here. Yeah. From what I understand, because I don't play in those regions much because I don't understand them much, and to be fair, I just kind of want to make what I was referring to as Empireland, where I just create an Irish British Isles and kick the English out, because that's funny to me. <laughs> um, so I haven't had a chance to play over there much, but I, from what I do understand, they modeled everything a lot better than they did in the previous game. That's encouraging. What I'm what I'm looking forward to is that from the way that the map is set up, it looks like they might add Japan, and adding a medieval, medieval Japan in would be incredibly interesting to me and right up my alley. Mm -hmm. It'd be fun to do that. So hopefully they do that. However, nothing official has happened yet. <laughs> yeah, probably have to throw China in first, wouldn't they? They would have to go through China first, and that would be interesting. The influence mechanic from CK2 isn't really there as much. There's a little bit of like you know, they are a, a Han tributary. That that does exist. And same thing for the Mongols. But last time I played and remember seeing the Mongols on the side of the map, they kind of pittered out extremely quickly. It was it was strange. Hmm. So I don't know. I'll have to revisit CK3 and see how this stuff goes. But it's a little... Things around the periphery are a little strange. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. So it seems like it's it's on the right track. We just They, they need to do what all paradox games do and spend two years making it nice and perfect with uh several paid uh dlcs but also some free lcs <laughs> to not be completely terrible mm -hmm. i don't know I, I i could talk about paradox's model for a long time but we have other games we need to talk about also mm -hmm. but speaking of other games yeah, what's next we have that's my drum roll total war games oh yes so there are a few that take place in the medieval period, not counting Total War Warhammer 2 with the Bretonians, <laughs> although they kind of are, I guess. Um, the ones that come to mind, uh, or the more recent ones we're going to be talking about, would be Medieval 2 Total War, Shogun 2 Total War, and the uh, Thrones Thrones of Britannia, I guess. I t played that one a little bit, not too much. Mm, yeah. And there was an expansion for Attila that was also in the medieval period. Yeah, the Charlemagne one. I, I bought that and I just never played it. <laughs> I actually liked that one a lot because it it was a pretty good depiction of the Viking raids into uh, into England at the time. It, it was a pretty wide variety of what you could do because I liked playing as the Vikings and going into England. Um, but you could also play as the, oh boy, what are they called? The Asturians? The, the Spanish... The only Spanish Christians in Spain at the time where there were the Moors there. Oh, yes. 
Uh, yeah, I don't remember what they're called, but you could play as them, or you could play as the Moorish people, or you could play as Charlemagne himself. There was a there was a lot of variety there, and I, I liked the mix. But I would say that overall, the Total War games for medieval games got the flavor correct, but not really the accuracy. Mm. That's a pretty consistent thing for the Total War game, yeah. I would say. Because I remember having a lot of fun back in the day with Medieval 2 and Medieval 1, because I'm an old fart. But I missed the boat on that one, unfortunately. Yeah, when you, when you look at the way they're structuring things, it, it's, you know, game first and foremost, and it's a game about painting the map first and foremost. And that's always yeah. going to run contrary to what you are, you know, air quotes, supposed to be able to do in a medieval-themed game, because... Right, like we said a million times in the Western Europe, we don't have the finances for these grand sweeping empires, right? Yeah, and the goal was never, the goal was never, I'm going to paint all of France blue or whatever, because at the time they didn't really conceptualize the nation state. Exactly, yeah. Excuse me, I just sneezed horribly. No, no. Wow. At the time, they didn't really have a conception of a solid nation state. Mm -hmm. It was just, I am the king of France. And it it stands to be pointed out, sorry. Before that, you're the king of the Franks, right? You're the king of the English. Like it's the, even the connection with the land is is different, right? It's the, Mm -hmm. you know, that that's a a very people thing, less of a state thing. So when you become France and when you become England, then that's, we start seeing the roots of those nation state ideas, right? And it's just not something that exists in the period that we're talking about. So yeah, I think you're right pointing that out. Yeah, it's um, it, it's kind of funny that later in Europe it goes back in that direction where they'll start becoming the king of the French again, as opposed to king of France or whatever. But it's uh, at, at the time, you know, they didn't really conceptualize too much. Like I, it, they weren't doing it for land most of the time. Mm-hmm. It, there wasn't really any kind of, as far as I can remember, no big um, Lebensraum kind of thing. Like we don't need to go like push these people out to get extra like farming land or whatever that wasn't really a concern Hmm. um you know a lot of the a lot of the things were a lot you know as we mentioned pettier or for money or whatever so instantly the total war stuff is kind of ahistorical maybe the closest one would be shogun too because during the sengoku jedi like things just kind of (laughs) happened yeah i suppose the 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 goal the goal of shogun 2 total war is a bit more focused and a bit more uh what a lot of these warlords are going for than you know this kind of amorphous thing you have in medieval 2 which is just conquer things yeah well you're you're just playing a medieval lord in medieval 2 and so even though it should be kind of sandboxy your goal is at the end of the day capture 30 territories or whatever yeah. whereas in shogun 2 at the time everyone kind of wanted to become shogun and so it makes sense but in the medieval western europe not everyone wanted to be man with 30 territories <laughs> yeah and, um, I mean, getting into the, the minutia of the fighting in those games, again, we have the same kind of issues where the Total War issues, right, where you're going to have cavalry charging and bowling down um, units of peasants, and yeah. it's, it's very uh, rock, paper, scissors, and that's what works for Total War, and it works to make a fun game, but it's you're, you're not really going to see armies maneuvering. Oh, and command and control, that's a big issue, because Total War, they'll do yeah. exactly what the hell you say whenever you say it. And exactly that's just that not moment. what's going to happen with the medieval army, right? They don't, you don't yeah, really have I mean, planning. They didn't have radios for the first thing. Like, <laughs> even if you wanted to say, like, okay, command delay, there's no command delay uh, for whatever reason because they have radios. There's no radios in the medieval era. So everyone does exactly what you want it when exactly you want it to be done, and you can always see everyone at the exact same time. And that's, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean. Possible. And all kings at the time were god, and they could just float up above and see what was happening. See, I went looking for no. examples of, you know, contemporary treaties on how to fight wars and whatnot, and you're, you're not getting, like, operations. You're not getting uh, tactics at the uh, the local level, right? No one's saying, all right, first you, you pin them, then you flank them, right? Like, that's just not how you're conceptualizing warfare at this time. You, you kind of you're setting things up with the leaders you're entrusting each leader to do what he's going to do with his battle or with his uh, his force and then you just kind of hope it works yeah. yeah it's like you have wings and that's basically all you can have is like the left middle and cent- and uh, right and that's kind of it you can have what you can see like in these cases like generals would be in charge of each wing basically 
and they could kind of direct those areas, but good luck getting all those sides to work together, even with itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, that's why a lot of the time you'll see these battles set up where one side will just say, we're going to make a stand on this hill or whatever, because it's way easier to say, just stand here and kill them if they get close than it is to maneuver or anything. Mm -hmm. And I can see why a game that's about maneuvering large units on the battlefield would want to, um, you know, give that option to the player. Although I would love to see a game that is, that sets battles up that way, you know, like, uh, all right, I've put you are on the left flank, you're in the center, and you're in the right, and you're the reserve. Okay, go. And, you know, you just kind of watch it play out and bite your fingernails and hope you don't get ruined. So like a scourge of war, but like medieval? Yeah. If it restricts you to that uh, that horseback seat, so you see a courier coming up and say, oh, the left, uh, left flank just crumbled. You're like, well, nah. <laughs> I stop unfortunate. <laughs> I think that'd be interesting, at least. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. I think it has its merits, although how realistic that is, who knows, because we don't have super great records at the time. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's one of the things about the medieval era is like, who knows exactly what went on? We can have we have like modern recreations of things we have. Uh, this, this is fun. Have you ever seen one of those like medieval um like medieval deathmatch things that they have i don't know what they're called exactly but it's like modern tournaments where people dress up in like knight armor and everything with weapons with like blunted weapons and they will just beat the hell out of each other and if someone gets knocked down they're out yeah. and so it's like guys of like 30 on each side representing frequently it's like a country's worth of guys so it's like 30 russians against like 30 swedes because this seems to be like a big thing in europe and they'll just go to town on each other and like they'll just flail at them with their shields or like knock them out with their uh, maces or i saw a guy like drop kick someone once basically <laughs> or just like they'll, they'll just like fling themselves at the a shield wall it sounds like that's what like that sounds like a tournament in the medieval so. it, 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 yeah it's basically like a modern tournament except like there's way less risk of someone actually dying yeah. maybe losing a tooth that could probably happen but like actually dying um uh, it seems very unlikely and um ba- basically it's, it kind of feels kind of feels like that hmm. i mean yeah. Well, I wish it felt more like yeah. that, though. The uh, you know, back in the day, right? That that kind of tournament style of let's get thirty guys on each side to wail on each other, and whoever's standing at the end is a winner. Right? That's part of training, right? That was part of how you got your knights to be the elite fighters they're going to be, right? You had the jousting, you had these melees, and I think like they only blunted the weapons like two hundred years in, like the twelve hundred or something like that. <laughs> so was, that's interesting. I didn't know. Yeah, that. there was a uh, people could get hurt. <laughs> But that was. A, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, but it was encouraged to to do this. Just under- playing with the boys, getting a little dirty. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, cut his arm it's off. It's practice, right? You you have riches yeah, and rewards, practice. and you're you're uh, you're learning how to fight. So I mean, that's what set the the rich, you know, military elite apart from everyone else. So that you could have these, you could attend these tournaments, you could have the training, you could have, you could afford to do this kind of stuff. So it's kind of fun I, that there's still, there's still you see that kind of stuff in Europe. I would say that that stuff would be like awesome if it still happened, but at the same time, I know that like as a freaking nerdy, skinny like fifteen year old, I would have just gotten the tar beat out of me, <laughs> you know. Like your 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 lord dad is like, go participate in this in for for trading, and all the other guys are like, oh, let's beat up that guy, uh, just like start kicking you in the helmet or whatever. That happens the first time, but then you get stronger, and the second time you you and then the second time you also get a concussion, but the tenth time. Knock you out someone else you, you. The, the, the tenth time you have irreparable da- brain damage from all the concussions you got. Now you're a proper soldier. <laughs> and now you're a proper soldier. <laughs> Speaking of proper soldiery and hitting people with shields and stuff, let's talk about Mountain Blade. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is, I would say, out of our list, maybe the most realistic um, puts you in the boots of someone fighting a medieval warfare game that we have on the list. Yeah, it does a lot that I like. Um basically because it does really highlight the logistical nightmare of medieval warfare (laughs) oh yeah because you have to like uh put cows or horses in your uh in your well not horses in this case but you have to put cows or pigs or stock up on meat and things like that in order to make sure your army continues to be fed or else people are going to be mad and just start leaving your army as it walks Mm -hmm. around the map and i mean the first i don't know 20 hours me playing that game was raiding joining up as a yeah. mercenary with some lord and then spending all my time going to villages and sacking them for stuff to sell so i mean that yeah. that that is nailing the medieval warfare simulation right 
Just yeah, visiting Mountain Blade, violence upon peasants. Yeah, Mountain Blade is definitely more of a an action RPG than a straight up strategy game or war game, but it does certainly have war game elements because you as one of this uh you, you you play a character in a fake medieval world and you go around and essentially you get to do what you want but a lot of what the game is geared towards is either you being a lord for a kingdom or like being a mercenary for them or whatever and so you can go and sign up with these various the various kingdoms to be a mercenary for them or if you do well enough you can be a lord for them and a lot of what you end up doing is like going around on the map and recruiting soldiers from places to levy them into your uh, into your little standing army walking around, which is, I guess, kind of realistic. They're they're basically constantly up and never going back home to farm or whatever. But the fact that you kind of have to go and personally levy these troops and invest money into them to make them worthwhile, mm -hmm. it kind of felt like you're I, I would say I would say that's more realistic. Yeah, like I, I can accept that they're not going back home if. You're, you're getting the bottom of the barrel people, right? You're getting the dregs of society who have nowhere to go, who are now going to roam around with you and be bullies and fight wars and, you know, terrorize peasants for, for cash. So it makes sense yeah. that, that that's what you do. I'm sure you can play nice in that game. I just don't know how. <laughs> yeah. And a, a lot of what the game does is that as you're, as you're leading your forces around, you can point to a, basically a group of your men and say like, okay, now it's time to charge or, oh, move up here with me. And the orders are very rudimentary, but I think that that is to the game's credit mm -hmm. because they can't be too complicated because how would they be so complicated? You're one guy commanding, you know, maybe a few hundred men. Yeah, well, as soon as the fighting starts, your yelling is not going to be heard above anything else. So I, I appreciate that the orders are go here, come back, <laughs> get them. Yeah, yeah it is pretty rudimentary. And... I, what's really cool is that you can set up the shield walls and things like this and have your archers like skirmish with them and things like that and it feels authentic obviously we can't say how things actually happened but in terms of you know how realistic these games are i would say this is closer to being a realistic depiction of medieval combat rather than being a completely fake made up one like some of these ones you're going to mention later yeah like i i, I mean back with number one for warband of whatever mm -hmm. everyone fought to the death for the most part and i mean that kind of took it away but here i'm seeing when i was playing more and more people actually like you they flee when yeah. the army takes a certain number of casualties so oh yeah they'll get they'll get up and route the way the morale is modeled is uh, much different than it used to be yeah so I, I, that goes a long way for me to to say like yeah this is very small scale very rpg still very like hero centric because you still have big characters that are walking around and kicking everyone's ass but it's it's much more reasonable in its representation of, you know, medieval warfare than a lot of other games. And I appreciate yeah. that. And one thing that I like outside of combat as well is that uh, when you're on a campaign, your, your king or whatever will ask like, okay, I need to run to the center up on me. And then on the map, you can go over to them and it will show all of the other Lords also depicted as little guys walking around the map. Mm -hmm. And you kind of just tag along with the Lord, but you can also go off and do your own thing. And that represents the um, the kind of independent mindedness of the Lords at the time, because at the end of the day, your men are your own and not your Kings. And so you can just kind of do with them what you want. And if you think that the King's idea is dumb or bad, you can just leave. Yeah. I remember a few times playing where the King was like leading us into what seemed to be a really ridiculous position. And I'm, watching my little character trundle along with a group of everyone else's army and thinking this is a stupid idea and yet here i am still wandering along with them and <laughs> this this must be how a lot of uh you know lower middle tier lords thought when they're watching their armies as part of these big big campaigning forces just doing a terrible terrible thing <laughs> and i should yeah. be smarter enough and uh and walk away but i don't <laughs> Well, the great thing about that is you can you can just get up and walk mm -hmm. away most of the time, unless you're too deep in enemy territory, then it's definitely better to stay with the group. <laughs> yeah, um, I see there's a lot of like a lot of sieges in that game, but they usually end in assault because that's fun to play. Yeah, so I can see why they, they do that. But you can siege things down if, you, if you're leading the siege, you can siege it down with a starvation, right? If you just sit there for a turn. Yeah, you definitely can. And I think that the timing of the sieges is more realistic in this game because um sieges will last for a few weeks to maybe a couple in-game months at most most of the time 
as opposed to these other games where it's like, oh yeah, these sieges could last years. And there were cases when sieges lasted years, but most of the time things wouldn't last that long. I would, I don't think. Oh, well, usually, I mean, okay. So if you're not, if you're not got a big enough force, right, you'll you'll last the campaign season. But if right. you've got enough forces or enough of a um, supply, you could just sit there for a long time. And you do, you do get a lot of these medieval sieges that last a long, long time. But yeah, they, well, they do happen. But I mean, well, in terms of like a small a smaller like castle being able to be sieged down i would say that a lesser amount of time is probably more expected than we're going to be sieging this for like six months yeah okay yeah because I, I think that the big towns in that game can take a very long time i don't remember off the top of my head how long they take but the smaller castles be like maybe a month hmm. and, and you can build fortifications in these towns to make them last longer against sieges but generally it's not quite to the time scale of a total war game where you're like oh yes i'm besieging this castle and i'll take it in about and you check the clock and it's like 10 years <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so like, overall i'm really happy with banner lord or mount blade 2 as a as a fun look at you know do you want to be a marauding mercenary in the middle ages and sure plop into this game you get a get a taste of it yeah and i, I like how the game also portrays various different um groups of fighters at the time because for for bannerlord 2 for example it has a faction that's basically the uh byzantine empire and then it has one that's kind of like the seljuks and then there's one that's like the normans and i think that that uh diversity is interesting mm -hmm. to show because in some of these other games it's very abstract especially ck3 it's very abstract like the cultural differences between armies but in this game it's very easy to see yeah, and at least the fun role playing stories because I got remember getting beaten up in a battle, taken prisoner, and being dragged down to the games North Africa, and then spending the next five in game years there, building up you yeah. know relationships and building an army, and basically changing the way I played <laughs> entirely because that's where my character was. So it's it's a it's fun to experience Mountain Blade. Yeah, Mountain Blade is fun. It's not the most realistic thing, but it's more than some other things. Yeah, and yeah. that's fun. <laughs> it's yeah. our tentative it's it's pretty good seal of approval yeah uh next on our list speaking of things that are seal of approval pending mm -hmm. i suppose is a chivalry ah uh, yes uh, chivalry medieval warfare is a mixed bag fun sure but uh kind of all over the place and this one is more i would say fps although it's not a shooter it's fp C F first person combat i guess sure. you run around as either like a, a knight in armor with a big weapon or a slightly smaller man with less armor or an archer or just like some unwashed peasant guy and you you, you duke it out and this is more of a mainstream depiction of medieval combat and it's not very accurate it helps that it's fictionalized you're like you know i'm the kingdom of blue and you're the kingdom of red and we must fight now mm -hmm. but Man, that game. Can I can I rant about this game? Because yeah, go ahead. That's what we're here for. <laughs> I played it back a, a long time ago. You know, not whenever it came out, but like a, a few months after it came out, and it was great. It was a lot of fun to have a multiplayer uh, melee em up, whatever you want to call it. You know, dressed up in medieval clothing. Because again, it's not it's not anything accurate or anything, but it, it's a fun game where you you know you have to parry and and fight and duck and weave and you know throw fire bombs at each other and shoot bows and arrows and crossbows but they have a tiered system for matchmaking so once you play long enough they boot you from the um like noob servers and and make you play with the big boys and let me tell you the big boys oh, no. do not know how to play this game <laughs> because they found some sort of exploiter bug where if you stare straight up at the sky or something and you can swing your weapon over your shoulder in such a way that it deals like way more damage because it counts the movement speed of like the camera tilting because it's like momentum based combat so I played my first big boy game and I was greeted by this ridiculous sight of like a dozen people whose cameras were straight up in the sky, like everyone's staring up in the, in, into space with their weapons behind their backs, just running at each other, spinning in place, and then half of them died. And that's just, that was the meta. Awesome. <laughs> that was what you did. So I went looking around and I guess it was a bug, but the community complained so vehemently that they just didn't fix it. And that's awesome. that was one of the last times I played Chivalry because I just thought, well... I like to parry and use my weapon to hit people, not 
learn how to freaking you know use 360 no scope but with a yes because what <laughs> like what <laughs> i don't have time for this <laughs> that's awesome i love that like unironically i love that i mean it's not good as a depiction of medieval combat but that's so funny what, like, i don't even know what you would yeah yeah 360 no scoping the sword like because no one was even looking at each other, just running kind of half backwards at each other and sprinting. check my elite knight tactics. <laughs> so I mean, that killed the game for me completely because I I couldn't get back to the servers with all the people who are blissfully ignorant of this you know pro way of playing. So I just stopped, and it died for me. Yeah, pity, a pity. I mean, there's um, no single player to speak of or anything. There's some interesting maps of like here's a, a long form castle assault map and that's kind of fun and there's field battles uh some some arena stuff but meh meh anyway next on our list is for honor uh joe did you have a chance to play for honor i i played it briefly when uh, i think it was hockey away for free a few years ago mm. but that was like when i was in the height of my comprehensive exam studying so it's all a blur, <laughs> and I I don't quite know anything. So was that? in the middle of uh, you you have a memory of you as like a knight beating up someone, and then you're just like, oh uh, yes, essay question that was in the game. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a very strange time in my life, so I have very vague memories. So maybe you should take it before <laughs> I start talking about shit that just doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, For Honor is kind of more like a fighting game set in medieval times than an accurate depiction of medieval stuff, and. For what it's worth, I remember having fun with it when I played it, but it's very, like, it's very stereotypical. Because you, you have the Viking faction, and then you have the Western European knight faction, and then you have the Japanese faction. I think they have added some other ones since then. I saw that you're, like, a quote-unquote centurion, but you're just some big dude with a sword, which is lame. Give me more Roman content in games, but... <laughs> So, so like, it's, like, you do all these fighting moves and everything, and everything is just completely ahistorical. Like, you're, you're like, one of the really, one of the Japanese classes, for example, is, like, you're a very large fat man with a huge club, and you can just grab people and throw them and stuff like that. And that's fun, but it's not realistic. Yeah, so very it, stylized. Is, uh, it's very stylized. Or... You know, the I think there's like a flagellant knight who's like one of those, uh, I mean, he, he flagellates you kind of like they would do to themselves. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Catholic um, masses at the time who thought that the plague was their fault. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like it's a it's a it's a fun game, but it's very, very, very ahistorical. What, that needs to be said. What's the opposite of self-flagellation? Is there a word for that or is it just flagellation? <laughs> I think the opposite of that is masochism. Really? Wait, sadism. Yeah, say, no, no. Sorry, it's it's the it's the yeah. S, not the M. Yeah, uh, <laughs> flagellation is like tearing your own skin off. Like, right? yeah. So you're uh, so you're that at that point you're just um, you know, doing it to other people, I guess. So it's not self-flagellation; it's just flagellation. Uh, interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. A little, little too. A little too kinky for my taste. Yeah, I looked it up just because, why not? Flogging or beating, either as religious discipline or for sexual gratification. So there you go. Anyway, we're talking about Ghost of Tsushima now. Oh, that was a quick run on poor. <laughs> <laughs> for Honor, for Honor's fine. For Honor's <laughs> fine. For Honor is completely a history. Got to the flagellants and out we go. Next. <laughs> There's not really much to talk about. It's an area control, like, multiplayer fighting game basically it it's fine like and but but it is we, we bring it up because it is set in medieval times and it is not accurate and that needs to be stated that it is not accurate mm -hmm. um so moving on to ghost of tsushima a game that we both like very much and played it recently actually mm -hmm. i actually also very inaccurate Sorry, hundred percent of that one. I don't usually do that. You one hundred percent of it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Got all. Yeah. I don't think I've one hundred percent of everything ever. <laughs> even games that I like a lot. Yeah, my wife rubbed off on me because she always one hundred percent for every game she plays, and I never did. But now I start to. So I don't know. Good, uh, good influence on me. So this game is terrible, is what we're saying. <laughs> it's a little fun, uh, and it, it's we need to go out of the way and and explain what they're doing with it right off the bat, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is it's not. The game is set during the Mongol invasion of Japan, which is taking place before 
most of what pop culture visions of samurai ever existed right like the you don't even have the 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 typical movie katana at this time but the game does of course because the game isn't about the mongol invasion not really the game is a a love letter to chambara films like a samurai fighting movies from the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s right and that's exactly the kind of stuff you get you get very stylized duels and fun sword play and all kinds of acrobatic maneuvers because that's what you saw in the films and that's what they did to represent the you know very overtly um cinematic duels in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries right when no one's fighting any wars in japan they're just fighting uh as a sport or training or to prove themselves to have some sort of human worth yeah and a lot of what was in the game happened kind of at some point but it wasn't when the game is set like wait, wait, what are you referring to then? So, so like you know, the Mongol invasion happened, but yes. the Mongols didn't look or act like they did during this time. Yeah, if and we want to get to that. We the can samurai, because if sorry, we want to get into ahead. the that it is set in the Mongol invasion, but it's also set in the island of Tsushima. But the Tsushima of the game is not Tsushima because Tsushima is positioned between Korea and Japan, and it's always been a place. Uh, you know, it's a Japanese island, but it's always been an important. St- station for trade between Korea and Japan, and as such, there's a lot of Koreans there and a lot of Korean influence there, and it goes back and forth a lot of mixed Japanese and Korean things, and there is none of that in the game. There is no Korean anywhere, <laughs> and further, the Mongol armies that invaded in the Mongol invasion of Japan were mostly Chinese and Korean soldiers, and you don't get any of that in that game. Because, again, it's not, like you said, it's not about the Mongol invasion. The Mongol invasion happened and it's set during that, but the game is not at all trying to touch on these things, right? It's just window dressing for a, a samurai movie. Mm, yeah. It's very cool, though. Oh, yeah. It's and I, 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 think I, that, it. I, I think that the initial part of the game where it starts off, where you're a bunch of samurai on horses charging down at the Mongols, that felt kind of realistic at least okay so that that particular battle did happen the 80 samurai at Tsushima did charge down the beach to uh you know stop the the guys that were landing there and were defeated (laughs) um as you are but so here's one thing that even got me is that they show one of the lords um going forward to basically say who he is and ask for a duel and the mongol being not not playing those games uh, sets them on fire and then you see the barbarism of these Mongols but also the weakness of samurai structure and how you're going to have to change to defeat the enemy, right? And it sets the whole game up. And that is a bit outdated in the historiography. The idea that uh, samurai at the time were still fighting these very ritualized uh, dual-based combat. Rigidly honorable. Yeah, where you, you walk up, you announce your name and your lineage and then you pair off and fight. Because that, that's how they're represented in the literary works, right? You know, the um, Heiki Monogatari has a bunch of those, but not, it's not exclusively that, but a bunch of these uh, um, literary works of warriors talk about these epic duels and these epic battles, because that's how literature works. I mean, it's all over uh, Trojan War as well, right? But, you know, we, we know from the way they're depicted on scrolls and the way that uh, battles are being talked about by other non-literary sources, and sometimes in literary sources themselves, that you know you're not pairing off and dueling right you're you're trying to get recognition mostly by uh uh identifying people of importance and killing them but it's not some highly ritualized uh a duel like you see in the game a lot right you're uh it's still a war you know that if you do it wrong you die <laughs> so it, it's it's fun that they're touching on these tropes that were part of how we understood this kind of warfare to to function but is pretty far from reality and the game embraces that. Like it, it's it's not saying it's being realistic or accurate. And like I said, the the uh, inspiration of the game is clearly Kurosawa films, and clearly the kind of you know lone Ronin with his sword at his hip, you know, which is also a six shooter, and he's also got a cowboy hat, that kind of stuff. Don't talk badly about Arthur Morgan like that. <laughs> and, uh, and this is coming from a position of. Uh, endearment I, I love the game and I, I enjoyed playing through it all the way through because it's it, uh you know you don't really get games that do this kind of thing and i think it'd be interesting if they spend a bit more time 
talking about the actual Mongol invasion, but they set up for a sequel. <laughs> it might happen. Yeah, Mongol invasion two, the one that happened what twelve years later. Yeah, later. Mongol invasion two. At this time, there's actually Koreans and Japanese here. <laughs> No, we'll not address it. They're just here. I now. wonder how they would do a sequel because there was a second Mongol invasion, and I mean you could just put it somewhere else, I suppose, but it wouldn't be your same character. Oh, and the end of the kind of feels set up for it. Yeah, didn't they end the game with um like you had to defeat the god Tsushima because they were going to sail on to Japan afterwards? Yeah. Like nah, nah, guys. They kind of they just like peeled off four or five ships to go and deal with Tsushima, and the rest of the fleet went on to Kyushu because you know. <laughs> You know, so that's how it goes. Most of Kyushu. But I mean, it's it's a fun game. Um, Not accurate, but then again, it's not trying to be, so I can't fault it. I wish it did a better job of representing Tsushima. I wish it did a better job of representing the war. And it would have been fun if they actually had period-appropriate weapons and armor and material. But they... Well, the armor's not bad. Some some of the armor's... uh, Time, yeah. time appropriate, so it can't be too hard. It seems more ornamental, some of it, than actually like. Yeah, like a lot of the know, um, combat worthy. The archer outfit and a lot of the um, special samurai armors are very that period. So, like, I appreciate that, but the the swords are off, and a lot of the other weapons are off. But that's that's fine. I know. I remember you mentioning this before that they wouldn't really be using swords to duel with in general anyway probably something more like a naginata right yeah um battlefield weapons at the time your sword you had a sword on for um like a backup in case everything went went wrong but the samurai at the time were really focused on um mounted archery because that was the highest Mm -hmm. skilled thing and you know it was pretty close range but then the the support units were meant to support against um cavalry so you had naginata that was the main fighting weapon and of course, that changes as you go along closer towards the Sengoku Jidai, and you're shifting towards armies made up of uh, enlisted footmen rather than samurai base with footmen uh, on the side. That's what you have in this period. So yeah, it's it's a very different style of warfare than what yeah. we associate with samurai being sword dueling, which again was never a thing. Well, okay, never. You can't speak in absolutes. Wasn't really a thing. In a period of the Senkoku Jidai either, right? That was a time of spears yeah. and guns. And towards the, the period of the uh, the Meiji Restoration, with the Shinsengumi and stuff, that stuff did happen. Yeah, uh, duel, duels and, and like small-scale actions, especially with like, the police forces and whatnot. And Because they were big nerds and they just loved they loved that stuff. Yeah, you were talking about the Boshin War. The Third yeah. War. yeah, they because that was... Yeah, I suppose that's the way to describe it, right? You have people who, uh, for their entire lives, have been told they're soldiers, and then suddenly they have to soldier, and all they have to go on is, uh, you know, dueling. Their history yeah. books and fiction, <laughs> fictional books. They're they're Based. they were reading fiction all their lives, and then I guess we're doing this, and that's how you get something like Hijikata. Yeah, you end up with battles where like they'll show up and then have some guns and fire off a shot, and everyone will miss, and then they just put the guns down and try and sword fight. In some of these earlier skirmishes in the Boshin War, <laughs> it's not. It's kind of funny how that happens. It's a very fascinating war, and I wish there was more uh, material out there in English for people to, to, you know, get a hold of it that isn't just Last Samurai. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, okay, so the last game we have on our list here is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I brought I brought this one up just because I picked it up recently. It just came out, like, a few weeks ago, like two, three weeks ago, and it's not obviously not a war game, but it does deal with warfare in the period um, in the uh, perspective of you as a Viking in England fighting various people. And while it's obviously going to have very Assassin's Creed elements, like, you know, you're, you're basically a super fighter running around and you beat people up with an ax. And there's always the, going to be the weird enemies that are like eight foot tall guys that can pick you up and toss you or whatever. <laughs> but the, the kind of more meta structure of the game is what's interesting in that, you know, it, part of the a lot of the story of the game is you helping uh, your local al- you making friends with local allies and building up fields, uh, which are basically peasant armies of Saxons to help you against either Viking rivals or other Saxon rivals. And the way that combat is shown in that game is interesting in those cases. There's several castle assaults because, you know, those are fun and everything. But the way that it's shown is that, you know, you'll frequently have smaller scale skirmishes of people 
raiding villages, you'll raid villages, or like with your longship. Um, but that's that's more, I would say, realistic, is like the small-scale ra raids and that sort of thing. Because you will see this a fair amount. You go and attack their supply lines and uh, raid them a bit. They'll try to do the same to your allies. And I, I think that in spite of the fact that it is trying to be unrealistic, it does kind of end up being somewhat realistic at the same time. It's kind of funny how it worked out. Mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't played it, so I haven't even... I haven't seen trailers even. So this is entire. You can tell me anything happens in the game, I believe you. I mean... <laughs> There, there is a sequence where you drink a one of the, your hallucinogenic potions, and then you basically take the place of Odin in Asgard prior to Ragnarok, and you have to figure out what's going on and everything. That is something that actually does happen. I'm not messing with you. I, I mean, I, I have no recourse. I, I, I believe you. This yeah. happens. It's a, it's a. I would say, pretty good game. Uh, it's my favorite Assassin's Creed out of the recent ones. Oh, it's not so. That's high praise. RPG. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's 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 a cool premise. You play as a Viking in England, and you get to go like raid monasteries and stuff. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Let me get into that. Ooh, ooh. Do you ever deal with a uh, um, Cuthbert and Lindisfarne? Uh, you actually show up after this. So you 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 arrive in England during the Sons of Ragnar Lothbrok's whole destruction of the countryside because they're so mad about what happened to him. Mm. So you miss that, but you do show up for other things. One of the big plot points is Alfred getting ready to uh, beat up on the Viking invaders in the south of England and everything. Hmm. And he's kind of like the big bad evil guy of the game. Okay, because that, that was the only connection I have to this period. Is uh, I, I did a year abroad in England, and I remember writing a paper then about uh, Lindisfarne, and they were like the monks would go carting around the corpse, the the undefiled corpse of Saint Cuthbert, and by doing that therefore laid claim to the region right like you, you're all belong to our monastery because we wandered through here with this holy relic of the undiminished corpse of cuthbert and then when the vikings showed up they had to like flee with him <laughs> i thought that was funny that just a bunch of monks with a, a coffin over their shoulders just running down the hillside <laughs> <laughs> just booking it that's 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 pretty funny um they uh i don't think you even go that far north because the furthest north you go in the game is a uh, yorvik i haven't even gotten up that far yet mm. um there's a little bit of the game where you can tool around in Norway a little bit, but that's kind of like the tutorial area. And then you get to England and you just cruise through the rivers and get kind of far west. You actually do run into some Welsh people, which they'd refer to in the game as Britons. And I think that whole that whole thing is interesting. It's interesting and much like an Assassin's Creed game, it's not super realistic, but it also does kind of paint a not very well-known historical period to a lot of audiences and brings it up with slightly less pop culture tinge. Mm. And I think that's, I think that the overall it is admirable, even if it is still going to be a historical. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I might have to actually give it a try then. Cause I, 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 I would, I would recommend it if it goes on sale, you know, it's uh, pretty decent to see how they handle the Welsh. Cause that's, that's a fascinating part of uh, British history, isn't it? Yeah, and you get you get some of the big personalities, and they're like Ivar the Boneless, uh, big big asshole, uh, <laughs> is involved in a lot of this. You, you you run into a lot of the big noted people at the times. Um, I don't know how much the Welsh are in the game because they're kind of in it for one chapter, and I haven't seen them come back up yet. Mm. I'm maybe halfway through the game, so I don't know if that's a big deal or not. Mm. I imagine it might be because Alfred's shown up like one time, and he's like the big dude of the period because he's known for being the guy who stopped the Vikings from. Uh, conquering all of England because he's like the one big English holdout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be interesting to, to see where they, how far they go with it. Yeah, uh, I would say overall pretty good. It's the combat's feels nice. Um, there's uh, the bigger focus on shields. I will say that it's a bigger focus on shields than there were in previous games, which is good because shields were such a big important thing to like the Viking fighting style. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. I have nice things to say about it, which is rare for me for an Assassin's Creed game. Yeah. Well, it sounds yeah. like we liked most of the games talked about today. And we kind of didn't, uh, we veered away from a lot of the heavier war games, I suppose, but that's fine. <laughs> I mean, there's not really many heavy war games at the period that I played a bunch of. There's Fields of Glory 2, but that one, I, we talked a little bit about this before we started recording, but Field of Glory 2 has army lists that go up to the early medieval period, but they're coming out with a new game now that's going to be um that's called the field of glory 2 medieval i think is what it's called yeah. and we're not sure what really differentiates that from field of glory 2 we were talking about it we can't figure it out because the system that they use 
works in other periods and works in other time periods. It works in the Pike and Shot period. It works in the the Shogun the Sengoku Jedi period because we've seen the same system work there. But mm-hmm. it's kind of strange because the army lists go up to 1066, I believe, in Field of Glory 2. And then they're making a whole new game for this period that it's already going up to anyway. So you can't really comment on that one too much, actually. Mm-hmm. But I have to wait and see what happens with it because it'd be it'd be nice to know that they do something to reflect the very different style of warfare at the time. But it's not yeah. sounding like they're going to. <laughs> yeah, because a Field of Glory two, I would say, is probably more maneuver focused than anything that was realistic at the time. Again, mm-hmm. um, be, because at the time, you know, you, the system is built for command and control structures that made sense like the you would have the pike and shot regiments that had more maneuverability and more i would say personal decision making opportunities than you would in the medieval period Mm. um and also you have the roman legions which were drilled and commanded to a more in-depth extent than you did also in the medieval period so I guess the system wouldn't make as much sense, but then again, we don't know what they're going to do to it. Yeah, I'll keep a keep an eye out for it because I'm I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that wraps up. I think the last of the games we wanted to talk about. So all that we have left really uh, here today is to discuss what we want to see from these games in the future. So more medieval combat games. What do we want to see from these? Well. I just stand at the top of the hill and spread my arms and shout to the ceiling that I want better logistics. I want yeah. them to make it hurt to fight campaigns in the middle period, medieval period because it hurt. It's expensive and it's pretty yeah. Cool. And I, I think it's kind of weird that like Mountain Blade is like the one that is this best out of the ones that we talked about. Yeah, like I was looking through my my collection of Age Odd games because mm-hmm. they do that really well, but the the closest medieval ones they have are Thirty Years War and uh, the English Civil War, and those aren't medieval. But they're the closest. Yeah, period. those are like early Renaissance games and pretty distinct. Yeah, and I was like, just they they could do, or they could have done an age odd game in the medieval period, and their system works so perfectly for it that I was frustrated I couldn't find one. <laughs> yeah, it is disappointing. Yeah, because they have the you know you have to have very you have very limited control over your armies. Logistics are is paramount. Movement can be interrupted by any number of you know piddly things with your general deciding not to act this turn or something like it, it's the perfect setup for it and it's just they 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 didn't do it so games like that give me a medieval age on that's what i want to see yeah i i'm with you there and one of the things that you mentioned here is that you also want to see games with slower paces yes for medieval warfare i agree with that uh one that actually did it well we kind of skimmed over this one is uh thrones of britannia the total war saga game hmm. the, the, the kind of smaller standalone one Battles are slower paced in that it's not realistically paced, but a lot of uh, a lot of combatants don't really go down super fast. It's not a it's not as fast of a game as your standard Total War is. Hmm. Battles do take longer. See, that'd be that'd be uh, better, right? Because again, you're warring with that uh, that TV version of medieval warfare where people are just have no self regard and they're just throwing themselves at each other and being butchered but you're you know if you're moving with your friends and you're trying to win this fight you're not going to be you know trying to jump kick a, a some dude to knock him over right you're it's it's about coordinated you know movements with your fellows so fighting is slower it makes sense right. Most of the deaths are going to happen when a side breaks and runs and then gets run down and that's just it's it's hard to do that in games because people want to see the violence if you want to like see the, the battle happening and you want to feel i guess the numbers going up like you don't want your battle to have slow moving and 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 practiced soldiers fighting but I'd, I'd like to see that yeah i i agree that that would be a thing that i want to see i really want to see medieval like naval combat all these games just don't want to show it like um medieval 2 just completely just 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 made entirely automated you don't Mm. see it at all Mm -hmm. crusader kings 3 doesn't even happen in it it doesn't at all oh no no there's no there's no combat in in, uh naval combat it's landing there's landing battles so if you like land on the shore then you take a big penalty if like an enemy army is there but yeah it's no medieval combat sea is really fascinating though because you're still at that stage of ramming and boarding is like king right so it'd be interesting yeah. to, to play some games that actually do that maneuvering ships into position to to 
to send guys over. I think you see it in the in the Total War game with um the 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 Charlemagne addition to the Attila game. I think you see a little bit of it hmm. there. Uh, I don't remember super well because it's been a bit, but the the game does have some uh, naval combat because I remember this because you there are like one of the big things is like as a Viking, you can just like land at the shore of a town and just attack it. And so there's definitely ships in it, which means there is ship combat. Mm -hmm. A lot of the recent Total War games have completely taken out ship combat. Yeah. Or like ships even existing. So (laughs) I suppose I I get it. It's hard to get right, but I like naval combat. I want to see. Yeah. Come on now. Okay. Well, we know when we start our own game studio, we're going to make, right? We're going to make a a hands off uh, medieval battle simulator. We're going to make an age of medieval and we're going to do medieval naval combat. No problem. We're we're gonna automate all of the the land battles, but the naval battles are gonna be really in depth. <laughs> as long as we don't tell anybody when we launch the game, <laughs> <laughs> we're the only two that want to see that. I guess. Yeah, I suppose so. There's not much of a. We're gonna make it happen, though. <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's the, the the major points that I want to see from medieval games is just something that treats it a little bit less fantastically. Same same thing that I want with you know games dealing with East Asia. I don't want the fancy version as much as I want the. Less fun grounded version because I'm just a no fun person to be around. I, there's there's merit in everything. Like I, I enjoyed the fun ones, like the the fun like Ghost of Tsushima's. Mm-hmm. But I also want to see, you know, the realistic version. Like give us both. Like we can have both. Yeah, I'm sure there's a market. There's a there's a people out there who want these kinds of things. Yeah. Some, but I mean, all all six of us do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I think that about does it. I think we're running up about to our time limit here. Uh, so do we have any parting thoughts about medieval games we want to share before we close out here? Um, I'm feeling pretty good. I always want to thank people for tuning in and listening to it. I always get a kick out of seeing um, that people are actually watching and engaging with our YouTube videos and our uh, podcast. So I, I appreciate it and I appreciate you guys. Yeah, always, always, one hundred percent. You know, we love hearing from you guys. It, uh, it's a, it's a big motivator knowing that people like listening to us and seeing what we can offer to the conversation in wargaming community. And so, thank you for listening. And, um, you know, as always, thank you to everyone who helped make this show possible. Uh, Kevin McLeod specifically, shout out to that guy for all of the license free music that we've been using from him. Mm-hmm mention him in the in the comments every time but still uh thank you to the various people that we've cited for today's episode we'll post some related links in the description yeah and we can post some of the um the works we've been talking about that we seem to you know ball up and throw away the names when we start talking but we we are consulting actual books here so we'll throw some of those up in the descriptions as well yeah i mean if we, if we mentioned everything by name this this would be like a three hour long <laughs> podcast and i guess there is a market for that people do listen to hardcore history but like you know we're, we're both busy men. We have we have day jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't have time to list our sources. But, <laughs> I but do that in my day job. I don't need to do that here. But we do. <laughs> we do have time to list our sources. We we, we will. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and the last <laughs> point: um, if you guys haven't, check out our blog. We have a Let's Talk About War Games blog where we're trying to put check up articles. Out our blog. Here. You write. Yeah. Um, I've recently we've got uh, Jack talking about DefCon as a proper scary war game um i put rules i translated a russo japanese war game we got some fun stuff up there so i'm really interested in the uh the rules for that game i might actually have to pick it up at some point oh it's a fun one super light a good incentive for me to finally get off my butt and learn japanese <laughs> hey maybe we can practice next time we'll do this uh, podcast japanese right guys oh no oh no i i won't be able to say anything uh, we can do it in rudimentary french to rudimentary japanese hey, or, no. you're probably much better at speaking japanese than i am <laughs> Uh, I like rudimentary. All right. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This has been a lot of fun, yeah. and um, have have a great December, everyone. We'll talk to you again soon. Yeah. Thanks for sticking around, guys. Take care and have a great day. Bye bye.